Hello and welcome to today's video and today we're taking a break from uh, the video recorders and we're going to start looking at some car related videos. Now I've got a few plans coming up for both the Jag and the Micra uh, which we'll be looking at in the spring. Um, today this video was recorded in late February so the weather isn't good enough to get out yet but we will have a look at these car care um, folders that I've got here. So I've actually got a third one which is on the shelf over there but I wanted to look at these two as they've got some quite entertaining things in them which would really sort of do uh, sort of age them somewhat but certainly back in about 1984 or 85 the car care folder was released you would get a binder and it was one of those deals where you had to collect a little bit of it every week. So it was the sort of traditional sort of thing that the binder and the first issue were super cheap, usually something like 99 pence or something along those lines. But then you had to pay sort of four or five pounds for each week's worth of, um, you know, each week's worth of information. You could get all of this in a Haynes manual for quite a bit cheaper than you could um, by sort of collecting the... In fact, yeah, there you go, there's the prices. It was... Oh, it was a pound each week. But uh, probably the first one was like 50p or something along those lines. Um, but each week you would get... You would get basically this which would be sort of coupled with a number of other pages. And those pages would either go into systems, electrics, there was also data sheets as well, projects, and a number of others which um, were sort of uh, sent out as well. In fact, there you go, there's the copyright. This was copyright 1985, and at the time I was six years old and absolutely fascinated with cars. And I managed to convince my mum to actually buy these for me. She bought quite a few issues actually, and then sort of would spend the time with me putting them into the folder. I think in total before she decided to not pay for any more, which I really don't blame her, because it just seemed to be never ending. And it was once a week that we would get this. We ended on issue. 56. So we collected it for over a year, which uh, is pretty good going. But it was, and still is, a really good learning resource because it covered all of the basics that uh, you sort of had on cars of the era. Um, cooling systems, ignition systems, suspension systems, brakes, Everything, so the basics were covered, and also basic maintenance was covered as well. Uh, like newer Haynes manuals, it had this um, spanner system. Um, I think it was here that I actually first saw the spanner system. So the Haynes manuals, or later Haynes manuals, actually came with that spanner set up. But it was absolutely fantastic. It was a really good, interesting... Um, ...publication which uh, did actually sort of, you know, sort of helped me learn quite a bit, certainly the theory of how cars actually worked. So I'm going to go into, let's have a look at electric. So bear with me whilst I flip over the binder. And some of the first parts of electrics, it's all sort of labelled electrics 1 and onwards. So electrics 1 through to 25. All of the sort of various basics, checking low te tension current, tracing faults in the dynamo. So it was still covering um, technology for cars which were certainly sort of predated the 1980s. But then again, they were still sort of fairly popular on the road. But it has some really sort of good troubleshooting tips in here, including suppressing radio interference, which is something that you can still use even today. Um, so you've got these little sort of uh, AM interference and FM interference suppressors which you would fit onto your coil. In fact there's actually one of them on my Jag and I didn't actually know what it was 
and now I do know because I've just refreshed my memory that it is actually a suppressor for the radio system. Uh, you've also got suppressors for HT leads, so you can have an inline suppressor. So a lot of these weren't sort of fitted as standard uh, to a lot of the cars of the era, but you could actually sort of fit it yourself. It also talks about setting up the points gap. It also talks about renewing the points, and you still had a lot of cars around then which were using um, points and uh, contact breakers and other bits and pieces. It also has a sort of a grit blaster. I used to have one of these. It was a Gunson's grit blaster, and it was filled with graphite. You would basically stick it onto the car battery and stick a spark plug in there and it would clean the spark plug. Um, I lost all of the graphite and tried using sand, but the sand unfortunately was too... Um, it was actually too thick, so it would actually clog up the electrodes. So uh, unfortunately I um, rather stupidly put it in the bin. I could have got some more graphite, but at the time I didn't know. So I just ended up binning it and just replacing the plugs whenever they got, um, whenever they got dirty. Also, setting up uh, point scaps with a dwell meter, aligning your headlights. You can see here it sort of really does age it. It's using um, an Austin 1100 to show you how to align the headlights. And this very same Austin 1100 is actually used quite a lot uh, for the various photos within, um, within this sort of car care, car care um, pack. There's one particular section which talks about washing the car, and it has the um, 1100 with the uh, front wheels off, and somebody actually giving the whole inner arch area a really good going over with a brush uh, attached to a hose. If you remember those, you used to get those brushes which would attach to the end of the hose. Water would come out the brush, and you could use that to wash the car. Uh, obviously, it would leave scratches all over the car because it's a brush, but certainly for cleaning underbody sort of areas it was absolutely perfect. We have the system section which was really educational for learning about the various different systems of a car. Talking about the talking about the engine, the brakes, steering, the suspension, the electrics and the transmission. So it talks here about the different types of engine configurations that you could get. It has a obviously blatantly a Cortina, but uh, not actually looking like a Cortina, but it is a Cortina to obviously sort of demonstrate some of the internal systems of the car. They always use sort of familiar looking shapes when sort of drawing the engines and the cars. I mean, for example, this engine blatantly looks like a Pinto, um, but they obviously don't directly draw it as a Pinto because you know you'd, you'd have to pay people sort of various monies etc to use the various sort of images in there but it does talk about starter motors it also talks about um, carburettors as well which is quite handy so it actually tells you all about the SU carburettor which was very popular on certain cars at the time it talks about brakes disc brakes drum brakes it also talks about outboard and inboard um, which is where I learnt funny enough about inboard and outboard brakes and it gives you there a couple of examples 2CV and GS 2CV uh, GS and Alpha suits have inboard brakes on the front wheels and the Rover 2000 and 2200 have them on the back also the uh, series 1 through to 3 Jaguar XJ6s and 12s also had inboard rear brakes as well also gives you inline engine configuration details, transverse engine configurations, talks about uh, inside of the engine, talks about the, actually talks about the auto cycle, which is quite cool, very educational, and certainly uh, was something I would sort of spend quite a lot of time poring over when I was younger. Talks about how drum brakes work, how your valves work, how a fixed jet carburettor works, and lots and lots of other 
bits and pieces. Also talks about different suspension systems, specifically those used on Citroen, so the self-leveling suspension. I think it also covers... Yeah, so it focuses on the BX there, for example, so it does focus on hydropneumatic suspension. But um, I think it also covers um, hydrogas and hydroelastic suspension as well, which was something that you did sort of see on cars of the time, certainly from, well, mainly cars from British Lanes. Yeah, here you go. So this is hydroelastic, and it also mentions hydrogas as well. So it does talk about... BL Hydroelastic and Hydrogas, and does explain it in quite a bit of detail as well. Also tells you the sort of typical cars where you would tend to find it. It also talks about linked suspension that would have been used on the Citroen 2CV and Diane. Also gives you the various problems that you can have with linked suspension systems, and does mention that the Austin 3 litre had an engine-driven pump to keep the suspension upright or sort of uh, pumped up at the back so let's move on to the next one we can have a quick look at that so the basic section gives you basically how to how to do various basic tasks on various maintenance tasks on your car this was the sort of um, car cleaning products you would get back in the 80s, nothing really exciting. Zip wax, turtle wax, those were your sort of big two players. There was none of this sort of canaba wax or anything like that. It was literally, this is what you get, that's what you're going to use, like it or not. Also had the various interior cleaning products. Again, very much a case of, this is what you have, that's basically your lot so if you come complaining don't come complaining to me sort of thing also has um, a rather useful set of buyers guides at the back which was quite cool and this is what i always used to sort of like when i was younger was looking at the what the car trim code means it basically had um your various sort of popular manufacturers such as ford british leyland uh, Roots Group products, well, Chrysler, Vauxhall, Fiat, VW, Renault, Citroen, uh, Datsun slash Nissan, and Peugeot. So, for example, if you had a top-of-the-range Nissan, it would be a DX, SGL, or a ZX, which um, actually sort of saw its way through quite a bit of the 80s until they sort of changed it again. Citroen, you had top of the range would have been GT, GTI, RS, Palace, and TRS, although I'd say RS was more sort of middle of the range. Uh, Renault, L and TL for your basics, uh, TS and GTS for your mid range, and TX and TXE for the top of the range. And that saw them through um, certainly up until the sort of late 80s when they started bringing in sort of RNs and RLs and other stuff like that. Also has this whole section about buying a car, which uh, is quite handy. Talks about the MOT test here, which is quite good. Talks about checking for rust. So talks about the various areas that they will check on the MOT for rust. It's all stuff that's sort of quite outdated now, but um, still could be quite useful if you're sort of coming to cars um, sort of brand new, so you can actually get the so the basics all from these manuals. Um, talks about the Morris Ital Buyer's Guide, and this was a car that went out of production in about 1983. And even at this sort of young age, it talks about wings, front wings rust through along the front and rear edges. Check the sills very carefully um, because they are structural. Listen for a loud rattling when accelerating hard. From the gearbox, uh, examine the lower lip of the boot lid for rust. So this really does sort of show that even at just five years old, you could get an Atal that was a little bit, a uh, little bit rusty, let's say. And uh, it does show various bits about the Atal. Talks about suspension, bodywork, engine, etc. We also have the Fiat 127 buyer's guide, so it does talk about the sort of the Fiat 127 as a popular 
uh, secondhand choice. And obviously it wouldn't be a buyer's guide for the era without a buyer's guide, comprehensive buyer's guide for the Mark IV and Mark V Cortina, or the Cortina Mark IV and Cortina 80, depending on what you want to call it. Restyled Cortina 80, 80, commonly called the Mark V, so even sort of various publications of the era do acknowledge that it would have been called the Cortina 80. But it does actually sort of focus on actual sort of rust spots here. That's probably on a Mark IV. Judging by that door trim colour, probably a Mark IV. The Mark V did fare uh, a little bit better for um, rust and sort of general longevity. Another popular second-hand one at the time was the uh, Chrysler Avenger. Or the Hillman Avenger, depending on what era you got it. Also there shows the sort of various rust issues that you could have experienced at the time. Obviously the Renault 5, another popular one. This has been the first generation Renault 5. Focusing on, again, certain areas where they can sort of rust. And the sort of typically the type, kind of thing that you would have found on the second hand market at the time if you were looking for a suitable car. Again, the Mini. The Mark III Escort, Citroen 2CV, so on and so forth. Now, one of my certainly one of my favourite sections was this whole projects section that they had. So, unfortunately, the little thing for projects has long gone, but it was very sort of period 80s things that you might want to do to your car. Fitting front front spotlights and driving lights. You know, it was sort of made popular by Ford on the uh, Mark II Granada and um, the Escort XR3. Nice set of driving lights on the front. Fitting a sporty steering wheel. Again, something else that you could have done to uh, uniquely change the interior of your car. Actually, some really sort of period options there as well. I quite like this one and also that one. Making yourself heard with air horns, real sort of period thing that you could have done there, sort of nice air horns. Putting in a radio cassette with a nice selection of uh, radio cassettes there, especially that one from Sharp. Period speakers to go with your radio cassette, including those ones that used to go on the parcel shelf. Fit in a front spoiler, so you had um, Richard Grant Automotive whom were quite a popular um, aftermarket body kit specialist in the 1980s. Produced a huge range of um, body kits, sort of rear spoilers, front spoilers, side skirts, etc. But certainly body kits were all the rage in the 80s. If you had a body kit, you really were going somewhere. Also talks about how to fit the spoiler as well, talking about pop riveting and other sort of things that we don't really sort of tend to do anymore. Um, fit in door mirrors because it wasn't sort of typically the thing that you would actually have door mirrors on a car, uh, especially if it was an older car. So you would actually have to fit your own door mirrors to replace the wing mirrors, which literally were on the wings. So there's a wing mirror and there's the installation of a door mirror. You also had electronic ignition kits, which was something that would improve uh, the running of your car and also fuel economy and in some cases power as well. Very simple things. Um, this Sparkrite one was quite a popular one at the time. I seem to remember my parents uh, Capri 78 or Mark III 3 litre gear had, I think it had one of these actually, but yeah it did have a um, an electronic ignition installed. Actually, it may have been one of these, because this was it was a contactless electronic ignition, if I remember rightly. But uh, it was certainly aftermarket. I don't think it would have been installed at the time of manufacture. Protecting your paintwork with mud flaps. You know, very popular again for the time. Nice set of branded mud flaps. Fitting child seats. Very period-looking child seats. Fitting extra gauges, that was something that uh, people used to do back then, was uh, install extra gauges, especially rev counters, 
uh, oil pressure gauges, voltmeters, etc. Fit in ammeters, so you can obviously measure uh, battery charge level. You also had various different types of fitting options for the various gauges. You could drill straight into the dash. You could fit a pod. You could fit one of those brackety things that went underneath the dash. Various different ammeters that you ammeters that you could have got. Fitting a tow bar. Wiring up your tow bar. Reducing drag of a rear spoiler. Again, some more uh, stylish Richard Grant offerings, such as this one for the uh, the Escort. This rather cool looking one here for the Capri. This one for the Renault 18, of all things. This nice one here on a uh, Austin Metro. And uh, rather unusually, this one on a Lancia Trevi. Haven't heard from, haven't heard of those for years. One of the big sort of things to have at the time was an electric aerial, so installing an electric aerial, should you so desire. Watching your engine speed of a rev counter, including this rather cool digital one by Tim, who were quite a popular aftermarket gauge producer at the time. Also, this is quite cool, fit in a fuel computer, so you could actually fit a sort of rudimentary trip computer, which is quite cool. It focuses on a particular one, the Mobilec Gasfix, Gasfax kit. Wider wheels for better grip, so focusing on the various different types of wheels that you could get at the time, including these rather dated but quite snazzy yellow tri-spoke affairs. This particular style doesn't seem to have gone out of fashion. Um, all of the others have very much gone out of fashion, but that style does seem to still be available today in sort of one form or another. Fit in sportier carbs as well, that's something that you could have done. It's a nice twin choke carburetor. Etch in your windows, so that was something that you would have done at the time if you wanted to make your car just that little less desirable to thieves. Vacuum gauges, yeah, that was certainly... Um, an interesting sort of very period option for the time which uh, supposedly told you how well your car was running literally done and achieved by measuring manifold depression vacuum carpet in your car some cars didn't come with carpets so you could actually get kits which would allow you to fit carpets to your car Making room for gadgets of a rather snazzy centre console. Again, not all cars had centre consoles, so you could actually uh, fit a centre console. Inertia reel seat belts. Again, not all cars had these at the time. And Kangol, yes, that's the people that make the hats, were, um, and I think still are, a very popular OEM for um, seat belts. This is probably one of my favourites, really sort of shows the age of this, but uh, covering up with a vinyl roof. Yes, you could actually, if you wanted, fit a vinyl roof to your vehicle that may not have a vinyl roof already, or may need the vinyl roof replacing. But there you go, you can fit your vinyl roof, probably to your Cortina. You can also protect your car with uh, an electronic security package. This one was used. This one's using a Canon alarm affair. Yep, that's the people that make the um, the car aftermarket car mats that you used to find in Halfords. But uh, yes, you could have a Canon aftermarket car security effort. You could also install a rear wash wipe if your car didn't have one. You could fit an oil pressure gauge as well. Oh, a map light, yep, you could have a map light. A black box accessory, so you could have a lights on, on alarm, an interior lamp delay unit, various other things that you could uh, install. Oh, look at that. Choosing and fitting a rear window visor. That is just brilliant. Stick that onto a Capri, it would look fantastic. I seem to remember on the Mark One Capri, the official Ford brochure called it a... Lamborghini style rear window louvre. 
But there you go, look at that. Installing, looks like it's been installed onto um, an Astra slash Opal Cadet there. But that really does look fantastic. I would quite happily have one now. Oh, pinstriping. Fantastic. Get some pinstriping on the go. Actually, this one, um, heated rear windows. Not all cars had heated rear windows, so this was actually quite good. Uh, quite a few aftermarket kits were available at the time. Um, so you could fit an aftermarket rear heated rear window. Used to be those weird ones that sort of used to just sort of sit in the middle of the glass, usually sort of big white coloured um, heating elements. Looks like here it's been installed onto an Allegro. Pinstriping again, you could uh, tart up your car with some go faster stripes there, looking good. Um, a dashboard clock, you could put a clock in as well, including a rather snazzy uh, compass for some reason, those sort of funny ball shaped ones. Built in fog lights there, you could you'd get these grills for various different models. Uh, which would allow you to um, install additional driving lights in the grills, which was quite cool. Voltimeters, high-tech driving computer, driving computer bits and pieces, seat belts. Oh, yes, this. The overhead console for the cockpit look. These were awesome. You had a big speaker and tweeter unit, a map light, switches for accessories... And they just look brilliant. Look at that overhead speaker, switches for your accessories. Absolutely brilliant. Unbelievably tacky, but I want one. I think it would look great, although unfortunately the Jag has a sunroof, so I couldn't install it. But I could put it in the Micra. That would look amazing. I've got to go on eBay now and find one. Anyway... Hope you have enjoyed this sort of trip into the past. If you have, don't forget to hit the like button, don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you again very soon. Thanks for watching, take care.